Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Sam Deiter, and West I'm Bun. here with Wes Bunn, the very talented Wes Bunn, and we are going to be going over some VR stuff. And if you notice right there uh, on my screen today, I have got, uh, Wes, go ahead and hold it up for me. And you can see that I got Steam VR going. So we have got a Vive here, and I'm going to show you guys how to set it up. So today, um, what we're going to actually be talking about is we're going to show off Steam VR. So I'm going to show you the lighthouse trackers, the, the headset, uh, the motion controllers. controllers, all that good stuff. Um, talk a little bit about what you need to do to set it up. Then we're going to talk about uh, virtual reality best practices, things that you need to know in order to give the best VR experience you possibly can. And then I'm going to show you how to set up a UE4 project to work with VR. Uh, even though VR works right out of the box, I'm going to sh show you how to just set up a, a project from scratch that's fully VR, uh, no controls or anything like that, but it'll work everything with the headset. Uh, we'll talk a little bit then about uh, if you're coming, say, from like film or ArchViz uh, or somewhere where you do you know, offline rendering, um, things that you need to be aware of when you make the switch to UE4 to a real-time platform uh, for making VR experiences like that. So um, let's let's just jump, jump right, right into in. it. Yep, let's Sweet. jump right in. So I'm um, gonna have Wes hold up the uh, the headset for me, and we'll talk about this first. So this is the Vive. It's just like any other HMD that's out on the market. Um, We've got the, the sensors here in the front. Uh, turn it around like that. You can see these little sensors right here. Now, these guys are what uh, the base stations sweep across. And you know you get the base stations that sweep like this and they sweep like that. Um, basically, think about it like it's GPS, but it's GPS indoors. So it's the basically, in a very, very layman's terms for this one, I'm going to break this down as simply <laughs> as I possibly can. Um, basically, what it's doing is these little these little reflectors right here measure the time that it takes for one laser to go past it, and then the other one goes past it. And based on the, the differences between those times, it can determine where it is within the real world and then translate that into the 3D world. Now, I, like I said, I grossly <laughs> sim slimmed that yeah, yeah. down, um, but that's basically what, what happens. And it's the same thing, too. I'm going to pop the motion controller in there, and you can see that it's full of its little sombrero hat, which I really like, uh, is full of the same types of uh, little, little reflectors. You can see them all over the top there. And what powers this thing is the uh, lighthouse. And if I can get you to zoom in on the lighthouse for me really quick, boom. So there's a lighthouse. Um, Basically, the lighthouse is, and you can see two little, um, two little gizmos in there next to the lights. Uh, those are basically like little, I'm gonna say hard, hard drive style mm -hmm. motors that spin around really, really fast. And they're actually casting the laser out uh, into the room. And I have, uh, I, you get two of them. And the coolest part about this is that you have one set to A and we have one that's set to B. And you set these up a little bit like security cameras and then you have a, a sync cord that you sync the two together, power them on, and then that is it. Everything nice. else, the, the headset, the motion controllers, it all goes into your computer. So it's like you have your headset and your motion controllers. Then you have over here on this side, separately, but still part of it, your lighthouse trackers. And this is really cool because you don't have to worry about like, oh, is there something wrong with the camera? Mm -hmm. Is there something wrong with this? Um, they are a little a little touchy, so you know, make sure you don't put them on something that vibrates. Or if you've got really loud neighbors upstairs, you might not want to mount them on the wall um, because if you do hit it while someone is in the experience, and I think Wes experiences mm -hmm. a little bit, mm -hmm. you'll get some skipping, or your motion controllers might go off track or something like that. So what's the what's the distance on those actually? Like so the requirements. Uh, the playable area is 15 foot by 15 foot, and it's like three. 0.25 meters squared, I think, oh, to, okay. for our European friends. Um, it's a fairly large uh, VR interaction area that you have with this. And you can go, you know, fully mobile, like if Wes was to put this on, we have a lot of stuff up here, so I'm gonna <laughs> suggest that he doesn't walk around on the stage, Fall but... Off the stage <laughs> for my VR experience. <laughs> it would be pretty lifelike, right? <laughs> um, uh, you can actually walk around this entire area up here in the headset. Um, I, we'll I said s we'll <laughs> see that when we start to demo it to the playable space area. Like yep. once we get inside the engine, and yep, and yep. We'll see it. Wes knows because I hit him all the time <laughs> with the motion controllers because he sits right next to me. I, I feel really bad about that, or it'll be really silent and all of a sudden, thud. Oh, <laughs> Sam's in VR. He hit a wall again. So, but it, that's all stuff you got to be a, a, a little mindful wary about. Of, yeah. yeah, mindful of. Um, and again, that comes back to uh, the soft and the hard bounds. Now, the soft bounds defines the interaction area which I play within. 
okay? The hard bounds is any area that's outside of that where I'm gonna run into something, you know, basically it's a non-safe area for me to go. And when I hit west, it's usually because I stick the controller outside the, the safe area because I'm not following the principle. So you shouldn't do that or, you know, you're gonna actually literally mm -hmm. poke somebody's eye out. So um, let's see, what else have we got here? Um, so we talked about the, uh, the lighthouse trackers and how that's a separate system. It's still the same system, but they're, they're separate. There's no connection between mm -hmm. those and the headset and the motion controllers, which is something that I really like because that's a lot less, less wires to worry yeah. about. That's just, you know, you can say, oh, you know what, my lighthouse tracker isn't working or my headset isn't working. It's not like it's one or the other. I'm mm -hmm. not really sure. So it makes it easier, in my opinion, to debug what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the motion controllers a little bit. And let's see, do we got anything else? Oh yeah, uh, motion controllers here. They've got, um, let's see, there we are. Uh, they've got a bunch of different buttons right here. This is a little trackpad, start, start a menu. I might have those reversed. Um, trigger button on the side here. Um, and all of this stuff is actually accessible right through the blueprints. So if you type into mm -hmm. the blueprints, motion controller, you will see all of the motion controller stuff that we have there. So um, the next thing that we're gonna top, we're gonna jump into, oh, uh, can we cut over to the, uh, the screen really quick? quick, I want to show uh, the Steam. So here's my Steam setup. Now this is my personal Steam account. And basically all you got to do is uh, go to Tools and you can come here and I do believe it's under, oh yeah, sorry, Library. You go to Tools, type in Steam VR and you'll download this. Once you've launched Steam VR, uh, you will get, um, and I'm not going to click on it because it's been causing a problem. It's been taking over the entire computer. But what you're going to get is you're going to get uh, these two little icons down here. One is the VR compositor, and one is this guy right up here. And what this guy up here is telling me is that it's basically telling me what's up with, what's up with the HMD and the two controllers and the base stations. Uh, because I don't have currently anything active in VR, that's why it's showing me yellow. Mm -hmm. But when we kick open our first Unreal uh, VR project, which we're gonna jump jump into here in a second. These will all go green, meaning that uh, everything is good to go. Another extraordinarily important thing you have to remember <laughs> with Steam VR: if you have anything overlaying your VR window by a pixel, it will cause you to lose frame rate, and your application will run at like 40 to 50 FPS. Um, the only reason I bring that up, we literally just had that happen. <laughs> I'm like, oh, 90 FPS, sweet, everything's working. Wait, it's only 40 FPS, what the heck is going on here? And literally it was because this window was like right over here, mm -hmm. and when the thing came up, when the VR preview came up, this was oh, overlaying man. the top of it, so it was causing a, a huge frame rate drop. So nothing that you can do to avoid that, that's just something that you have to, to be aware of when you're using Steam VR. So. Let's go to our next section. We're going to talk about some VR uh, virtual reality best practices. Um, one of the first things that I want to talk about that something that I've, I've fallen folly of this one as well um, is that remember in VR and, and 4.9, you render everything twice, right? Because you have two eyes. So if I'm rendering you know, this, uh, this mouse right here, and let's say the mouse has two materials on it, well, I'm going to have to make four render passes. I'm going to have to make you know, two for my left eye and two for my right eye. Now. In later versions of Unreal Engine, um, I don't know if it's going to be in 4.10. Um, you can get it from uh, our, our, our repository on GitHub, because uh, we're currently testing it, but we are actually going to be introducing some instancing okay. that will actually reduce all of that, um, that extra overdraw by quite a bit to save you a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, they actually used it in, uh, in Bullet Train, the demo, uh, to get callback quite a bit of, uh, of performance um, one second, let me check my notes because I actually have how much it cut the, uh, so when they introduced this on bullet train, it cut the draw thread by 1.5 to 1.7 milliseconds and the CPU by, by about 0.75 milliseconds. Now that might not sound like a lot, but 0.75 is almost one millisecond mm -hmm. and that is quite a huge savings right there. So uh, be on the lookout for that, um, but remember, you got to render everything twice, so keep that in mind. You know, even with these uh, optimizations coming, still you have to remember that you got to render everything twice in VR. So you have to be very, very careful what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to do, you know, Correct. the kite <laughs> demo with all of its fancy settings and everything like that because it, it, it's VR, yeah. so much power and resolution that it requires. Because remember, you're rendering two eyes mm -hmm. that the tech just 
it's it's not there yet. It's not there yet. Yeah, it's just not there yet. So it it's going to be there, and it's going to be totally awesome. But also, you know, the first consumer baby headsets steps. aren't at yet. Baby it's, it's baby steps, man. <laughs> it's baby steps. And of course, you know, everybody that's viewing in today, you guys are all the the front runners in this. So you've all got your foot in the door. So you're you're going in the right direction. We just sometimes, you know, we got to wait for technology mm -hmm. to catch up with the software. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about um, is some things that you might not necessarily know that you shouldn't do inside of VR, <laughs> uh, because you see them in a lot of games, and so people want to emulate. And let's talk about, I don't know, you know Call of Duty, right? Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about Call of Duty. We'll use that, or actually better one, let's talk about Unreal Tournament. Unreal Tournament would be a better one, because this is a very, very, very fast-paced yeah, game yeah. with lots of Bob, um, you know, Bob, like when you're moving around like this. Mm -hmm. Never do that in VR. You should never do anything in VR that takes uh, control away from the, 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 ugh. You should never do anything <laughs> in VR that takes camera control away from the player. Um, I don't know, Wes, you worked on like UFC fighting games. So, you know, like at the beginning of a fighting game, we might have like a camera that drops down like this and, mm -hmm. you know, Kinda goes, pans yeah, around. yeah, pans mm -hmm. around. While that looks great on a 2D screen in VR, it's very disorienting yeah. when you're not in control of the camera. It'd be like if I took my head and started moving it around, you know, left and right. Yeah. Nobody likes to do that, and that is effectively what you're doing when you move the camera in VR for somebody. The player should always be in control, in control of their of camera. That's one of the things I've noticed in, in my limited experience working with VR with Sam is when I have control of the camera, it feels a lot better than when I don't have control and letting the camera move on its own, I start to get a little bit nauseous. Yep, so. yep, yep. And speaking of nausea, when we say that, that's called simulation sickness. Mm -hmm. And there is a whole slew of things that can cause simulation sickness. And this is some of the stuff that we're actually going to go over right now. Um, one of the other things is dynamically adjusting the FOV. You know, uh, if you... They don't do this in Unreal Tournament, but they do it in like Call of Duty mm -hmm. or Battlefield. But you bring up your gun, yep. and then your field of view changes, and you get a little bit of blur going mm -hmm. on here. Depth of field. You, yeah, depth of field. You don't want to add depth of field. You also don't want to change their FOV. You know, when you go up to aim in, in, in real life, if I, if I went up to aim something like this, you know, I'm going to get a little bit of a natural depth of field because I've closed one eye. Mm -hmm. um, I'm focusing down. I'm focusing on this part, so this is going to become blurred right here on my arm. That's all going to happen regardless of what you do yeah, in the shader. You have to try to enhance yeah, it. So you yeah. don't need to enhance that. You know, you can spend that time developing somewhere else. And then another beautiful part about this is depth of field. That costs a little bit yeah. of time to render. You can get rid of that. They'll still experience it the same way. And you've just saved yourself a couple milliseconds on your GPU there. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about, let's see. Oh, here's a really important one. Um, be careful when you fade. Now, some people will fade to white, some people will fade to black, and VR, always fade to black. Uh, the reason why, you don't have a lot of your natural abilities to, when you see something that's really bright, you might turn your mm -hmm. eyes away like this, or you might away. put your hand away. Well, <laughs> when you've got this headset on, you can't put your hands across like that. I mean, you, you can only really close your eyes, but having that really bright yeah. HDR white light in there, it's 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 almost migraine inducing yeah. if you stare at it too long because it's just so bright because you know there's no light coming in so and you can't look away which you would normally mm -hmm. do. Um, I saw one girl at the the game developers conference who she was going through all these emotions like she didn't want to see the, the 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 big scary monster in the showdown demo so she puts her hands over there but her hands <laughs> over the eyes but the thing is still there and she's like she turns away right so she kind of like still turns away like this but you know she has her hands like literally over the front <laughs> of the head mounted That's display awesome. and she's like oh my god it's a scary monster it's not going away i'm like well because you're you know you've got a giant <laughs> hunk of plastic in front of you so um but again you know Things like that are things that you might not consider when developing products mm -hmm. for, for a 2D monitor. So that's all things that you, you have to consider. Um, you know, fading to black, making sure that it's not so ridiculously scary that someone might throw the headset across <laughs> the room or something like that. Um, uh, here's another good one. Um, if you have to move the player, you want to give them instant acceleration. So you don't want to like gradually build mm. them up to speed. You want to actually instantly accelerate them and always allow them you know to go in the direction that they want to go or if you're doing like a rail shooter mm -hmm. then always give them you know full 360 degree movement um, and don't make any abrupt uh, uh, direction changes like all of a sudden he's going forward and then all of a sudden he just jitters back like this that's a great way to induce uh, mm -hmm. simulation sickness as well 
or uh, we tried one uh, where the camera stuttered just yeah. a tiny bit. Uh, there was one demo that we were trying and the camera stuttered just a tiny little bit, like it just went forward and instantly you're like, whoa, yeah. this is. We, had, we tried the camera lag when we were doing yeah, the dragonfly yeah, thing, so the yeah. camera kind of glided in a little bit behind you. Yep, yeah. and, and it, it, it it seems like it would be cool, and yeah. it looks really cool when you're testing it, but then when you put it on the headset, and you're you do like, do it multiple Whoa. times, that's what it's like. Well, it, may, it may not impact you your first instance, but the more you do it, and you've got to think of your players, because they're going to be doing this over and over and over again. The first time, it may not get you, but you keep and doing it. And this yeah. actually brings us into another really, really good point. You are actually the worst VR tester ever, <laughs> because you've used it for such a long time, you're going to get really used to it. The best people to test VR would be like your mom mm -hmm. or your grandma or the kid down the street, just as long as he's over 13, so you know you don't <laughs> violate the Oculus safety rules or whatnot. Um, because you've, you're, you're so used to using VR that you've quickly become accustomed to, to basically powering through simulation sickness. So, I mean, and there, there have been some times uh, I was out in Seattle doing some research for the Vibe before we had one here, and I had to go home one early one day because I gave myself a, a cluster headache right here from doing something. Mm -hmm. I, I was just trying to power through something, get something done, and in the end of the day, I, I was just, I was destroyed because <laughs> my, my head literally hurt so bad, but that was because I was trying to power through the VR experience, mm -hmm. and because it was laggy, um, I was doing a lot of stuff that you weren't supposed to be doing. <laughs> um, but again, you know, you want to stop that. Uh, you don't want these things to happen. Um, uh, I can actually post, there is a great uh, write-up that Oculus did. Um, it's very technical. Uh, and a lot of the information that I've shared with you today I distilled from this document. But it's basically Oculus had a bunch of people test out the Oculus mm -hmm. headset and then they recorded like all of the things that people said, hey, this gave me simulation sickness. This made me feel really nauseous. This made me feel like I was falling or, or things like that. So it, to, to recap on all of that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk to Alex and see where we can post a link to this document. But it's very, very important that as a VR developer that you at least skim through this and, and get an idea of some things that you can and cannot do in VR just to ensure that you have a, a little bit of an idea of what is, what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Now, these rules aren't set in stone, right? Because VR hasn't been around long enough. Not enough people have used it to say like, definitively yeah, you do this thing. The do's and the don'ts. It, it, yeah, it's, it's going to give you simulation sickness. They might suggest that you not do something and then you find out through testing, hey, you know what? This isn't motion induced, this isn't sickening at it, it, it all. It's, it's, it's not that it's necessarily wrong or right, it's a great starting point for mm -hmm. you to build up your repertoire of, hey, I know for a fact that you know doing this leads to simulation sickness, or I know this gives them a great experience or mm -hmm. something like that. So again, bleeding edge tech, there's tons of rooms for experimenting and figuring out what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Um, one of the other things I wanna touch on about uh, VR is uh, scale. And scale is really important in VR. Um, we actually have inside of the editor uh, and the project settings a uh, VR scale option. Um, and basically, you can set that, uh, I believe it defaults to 100 uh, CMs. Uh, you can either increase that or uh, increase or decrease uh, that number. What you'll do is you'll make yourself feel like a giant in the world, and you make yourself feel really, really tiny. And the reason I want to bring up scale is, a lot of times in video games, we kind of make things bigger mm -hmm. than their real world counterparts. So, you know, we might make this keyboard twice the size or something like that. Well, in VR, it's really weird to come in contact with something <laughs> that's twice the normal there, yeah. size. <laughs> you know, you go up to this cup and you're like, God, I can bathe in this thing. <laughs> um, so you always want to match uh, centimeter for centimeter, if you can, um, the real world size of something. Now, perfect example, what if I have a game that doesn't take place in the real world? Mm -hmm. Well. You know, a coffee cup is still a coffee cup, yeah. and it's still going to be relatively the same size. Mm -hmm. So you need to really ensure that you've hit the scale right, just to give people. Uh, it's going to make the immersion that you yeah. get just kind of so much better. Them in yes, the exactly. A bit better. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and when in doubt, test, test, and test some more. If you're worried that the scale is too too big for something, give it to somebody to try out. Ask them. But don't tell them what you want them to, to look for, right? If, if you know the coffee cup, you're like, man, this coffee cup's too big. Don't tell them. Just say, hey, I need you to test this. Tell me what you think about it. And when they do that, what they're going to do is they're going to test it, and they might not even realize that the coffee cup is too big. And if they don't say anything, 
don't worry about it because mm -hmm. it's not too big. It might be in your mind, but in their mind, if they don't say anything about it, then there's no point in, in changing it. Um, let's see, what else do we got here? Ah, here's another good one. Um, one of the content optimization tricks a lot of people do is on um, objects they might remove the back face. So like, you know, oh, yeah. if uh, if this couch, you know, we know we're never going to see this couch turned over, they might delete all the polys across the bottom. Uh, it's an old school development trick. Do you still use it in mobile games, console mm -hmm. games, and modern computer games? Modern GPUs can chew through polys, yeah. so it's not as needed as it once before was, but you should never do this in VR because remember, in VR, I can look underneath the couch, <laughs> I can look around at the couch from the side, I can look at it in a lot of different areas that I normally, in a regular game that I would play on a monitor, wouldn't be able mm -hmm. to view this from. So, you know, don't go anything, you know, writing weird messages on the backs of things, or, you know, uh, deleting stuff, uh, deleting faces, because um, you're not going to you're not going to claw back that much performance. Um, we're going to cover some performance stuff about this, but you know, it's it's always infinitely more expensive to render a pixel than it is to render a vertice. And modern GPUs can just chew through vertices. You know, they can just chew through them, but it's always going to be more expensive to render a pixel. So when we come to the optimization, I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more detail. But just remember, verts, you got to have them. Keep them there. <laughs> ah, here's another good thing. Normal mapping. So normal mapping is a little weird inside of VR because normal mapping yeah. takes into consideration that you're on a, on, mm -hmm. on a 2D monitor, and it, I don't want to say it, it doesn't hold up very well um, at uh, it, certain distances. Now, that's not to say that you don't need normal maps. They mm -hmm. work really well with reflection, with the reflection probes. What you need to start doing with your normal maps now is evaluating whether or not adding a normal map to this particular object increases or decreases yeah. this object's fidelity. Like, mm -hmm. does it make it better? If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Use it somewhere else. You might find on some objects normal maps work awesome. You might find on other objects that, you know what, this normal map's not really giving me anything, so get rid of it. You know, and again, you got to test, 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 test to make sure, you know, enable a normal map, take a screenshot. Disable it, take a screenshot, you know, and then you know, use the window keys to compare back and forth. Like, what's it look like? You know what? I can't really tell mm -hmm. the difference. Cut it. It's gone. That's one less thing that you have in memory. It's one less texture that you need. Uh, it makes your shaders uh, less uh, less costly. So you might need them for a lot of things. I shouldn't say it. You might need them for some things, but mm -hmm. you're probably not going to need them for everything. But it's one of those things where you can't just say, you know what? We're yeah. going to cut all normal maps. Um, it just requires a lot of testing. Um, and some of the other cool things you can do, you know, normal maps are there to make up for, uh, you know, just raw computing power that we didn't have, mm -hmm. or to make up for, um, you know, like, I don't know if we can see it on this keyboard here. Um, uh, it's really hard to see, but anyway, right here, it's it's got these uh, little indentations. Um, they're like these little circular ones. I don't know if we can, yeah, yeah, you can, you can you kind of see them a little bit. But that is what is perfect for a normal map. You know, because putting all of these little tiny things in there require a lot of geometry. So mm -hmm. these are the types of things that are good for, for normal maps. Um, if you have to make up for that, you could do something like parallax occlusion mapping, which is all done in the pixel shader. Um, and it's a very, very fancy way to simulate geometry that's not there. Um, Ryan Brooks, uh, one of the senior TAs here, he actually made a parallax occlusion mapping. Uh, it's in 4.9. Um, it's a node from the material editor that you can use. And it will... Um, it will make up for the lack of geometry that's on the surface. Now, it is an expensive shader operation to use. However, if you have it in a, in a small section of your screen, so you're only doing you know a couple hundred pixels, not going to be ridiculously expensive to do over time. Um, and then finally, if you really need to do it, you can always add more geo. And you know, again, you know, VR VR boxes are going to be very very high end boxes with very high end video cards. So adding a little bit more geometry for it to chew through isn't going to be that big of a deal. Again, it's going to be your material complexity and things like that. So let's um, scroll down here really quick and uh, okay, just seeing if we had any uh, any crazy questions that I could answer at this point in time. No, no, no. Looks like we're all good on that. So let's go ahead and um, let's actually just jump right into Unreal and start making a, uh, hold on one second, my monitor has gone black. OK, there, there we is. go. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, that was scary. <laughs> oh, man. Um, OK, positive, go back full screen. 
and okay we're gonna make a new project and uh, what I'm gonna do here is we're gonna make a we're gonna start off with a blank project and actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off with mobile scalable 2d 3d and no starter content and it's just gonna be my live stream VR now the reason I'm doing this is Building any project, especially VR, mm -hmm. is kind of like building a house, right? You need a great foundation, and then you add on the features that you want. Um, recently, today, I found out that in 4.9, AO uh, is causing is actually being rendered at 2.5 milliseconds per eye. That means AO is costing you 5 wow. milliseconds to render. And that's the difference between it shutters when I move side to side, mm -hmm. and it's absolutely seamless. So if you're uh, using 4.9 and in previous, uh, disable AO in your post-process volume, and then rely on the light mass post uh, or the light mass AO bake to put the AO inside of your uh, light maps. Um, because again, we want to go as slim as possible on VR to make sure that we can keep that 90 FPS or the uh, what is that one 120 and what was the other one like 75 or something like that. Um, because we need to keep the, you know, we need each eye to mm -hmm. render as fast as as fast as computers possible um, to make sure that we have the best experience possible. So, when we start this project again, like I said, mobile tablet, scalable 3D or 2D, no starter content. Now, of course, all of this stuff that I'm about to set when I create this project is all completely changeable. Once you've gone into the project, you can either change it inside the project settings, you mm -hmm. can change it in the I and I's, you can add the post process volumes yourself. Um, so you're not really taking anything away from other than you might have to go hunt down where you turn something on versus just turning it on. So let's kick over here to VR preview. Now, one thing I wanted to show you, if Wes goes ahead and puts on the, uh, the headset, and there we go. Okay, yeah. So if you can see on my screen right now, we're seeing the VR preview. And uh, if I, I'm gonna do stat FPS really quick. So you see we're a, a rock solid 90 FPS right there. And that's because we have literally nothing enabled in this scene, right? We have the skybox and the ground. But as you can see, I didn't set anything up besides creating a new project and he's using the headset. That's Unreal literally how works. Yeah, that's literally how easy it is to use VR inside of Unreal Engine 4. You plug it in, you turn it on, start a new project, and I'm I ran it in the VR previewer. And Wes is now looking around inside of VR. And I didn't set up anything. I didn't touch any code. I didn't do anything like that. So it's ridiculously easy to get this stuff up and running. Um, Wes, I'm going to kick you out of here. So, uh, Oh, that's the other thing. Let people know when you're going to end the <laughs> VR experience. Because all of a sudden, they could be looking around and doing this. And all of a sudden, the image is going to go, the image is going to stop in their headset. And they're going to be moving around like this. And they're going to be like, whoa. <laughs> this is really, really, really disorienting. So, um, Excuse me one second, I gotta get a drink here. I'm so glad I brought water this time. So let's uh, let's set up this project to work with VR. So the uh, the first thing we're gonna want to do is we're gonna come up here to blueprints and um, we're gonna search here and we're gonna make a player. If I can spell player camera manager. And what, where is it? Let me see. Oh, right there. Okay. We're just going to do this VR. Okay. And then on this guy, we're going to open him up really quick. And all we've got to do is right over here in the details panel under the player camera manager, we want to follow HMD orientation, compile, save the blueprint. That's done. Okay. So we have that set up. And again, very simple setup. This is going to get you up and running with something that is targeted towards virtual reality. But uh, it's, it's very simply, you know, baby steps, baby steps. So next we're going to make a player controller. Again, uh, make a new blueprint. And player controller is right there. VR underscore PC, player controller. Open him up. And what we want to do here is in our details panel under player controller in the player camera manager class, we want to point this camera back to the class that we, uh, we back to, yeah, the one that we just created, back to the uh, VR camera mag right there. So that's set up. Now we're going to want to make a pawn, and we'll come here, 
and we can just click a regular pawn and we'll just call this VR underscore pawn. Okay. Um, and one thing that we have to do for the pawn, and this is specific for the Vive, is we need to come here and it's called camera base eye height and we need to put that to zero. Now the reason we do this is actually when you go to calibrate the Vive, mm -hmm. you need to put it on the ground. And when you put it on the ground, you put basically I put it on the floor and I put the two motion controllers next to it um, because literally the ground that it sits on is going to be the ground in the simulation that you're mm -hmm. playing because it's a full room kind of VR style yeah. experience. So you want zero, zero, zero to basically be at the base of your okay. feet. So that's why we want to set the uh, the camera base eye height to zero, zero. Now, if you're doing something else with uh, another headset like you know, Morpheus or Oculus or something like that, you'd want to leave that alone. This is specifically for the Vive headset. So we've got that set up. Um, now the other thing we need to make and if you look at the docs, I actually forgot this part, so we're gonna go over it today. We need to make a game mode. <laughs> and uh, we can just come here and actually... It's also at the top, too. Is it? Yep. Uh, three up from the bottom. Ah, right there, yeah. boom. If it was a snake, it would have bit me. So we're gonna call this VR game mode. And let's see here. Let's just uh, save this and we'll call this my level. Okay, so now we've got a level saved, so when we come back into it, um, I'm going to make this a tiny bit bigger so I got a little bit of more real estate to work with. Uh, the reason I'm not going full screen is going full screen really messes with the compositor, so like I will get stuck between seeing what the Vive is seeing and seeing what's going on mm -hmm. here in Unreal, so um, just something to be aware of. So I'm going to save everything really quick in case something happens. Um, so now what we need to do is Let's see, we want to do our world properties, which is under world settings here. And so we want to, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to override our, uh, our current game mode because you see I can't actually edit anything right here. So I'm going to override this with our VR game mode. And then I'm just simply going to come in here and start changing stuff. So we'll place the default pawn to our VR pawn. Um, our player controller will be our VR player controller. And I think that's Pretty it. Good. I think that's all we need. So what should happen now, uh, Wes will be able to put on the headset, um, or anybody will be able to put on the headset, and you will have a similar interaction to what you had before. Uh, the only difference with this is that now you don't have any of the keys set up, so you can't do W, A, S, and D to move around. But what you have now is you have just a basic VR setup, which you can now start to iterate on and you know add a little bit of maybe some controls to your uh, player pawn, or you can start having the motion controllers do interesting things, or or anything like that. This is just gonna I'm gonna kick out of there too, Wes. Um, this is just to get you up and running. And let's see one. Let's see what else have I got here. Okay, so now that you're up and running, let's actually do something that's kind of cool. Um, what we're going to do here is I'm going to open up the VR Pawn, and uh, I'm going to open up the full Blueprint Editor. I'm going to come over here to my viewport, and we're going to set up some motion controllers so that uh, when Wes moves around, he's got some, some cool motion. So motion controllers are actually pretty, pretty easy to set up. So we come up here to Add Components, and we type in Motion, and we see we've got a motion controller here. And I'm actually going to uh, duplicate this. and Basically, I want to call this MC, oops, MC underscore left, right? And over here on my motion controller, uh, player index zero, which is good, and I want it to be my left hand. And we're going to call this other one MC underscore right. And we're going to want to make sure that the hand is set to, come on, the right hand. The next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to add a static mesh component here. And I'm going to add one. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate it. And we'll say SM underscore left and SM underscore right. And then we're going to take the left one and we're going to drop it on the left motion controller. We're going to take the right one and we're going to drop it on the right motion controller. I'm going to come here and all I'm going to do is uh, actually first, sorry, I got to, I have to compile you. Let me close him really quick. And I need to enable my engine content so that I can uh, have some static meshes to work with here. So I'm going to go back to my viewport. 
Uh, I'm going to click on the left static mesh, and I'm going to come down here, and I've got a cone. Um, you should uh, also lock this up here on the scale and just do 0.1, um, or you're going to have these gargantuan cones hanging around. It looks, it look, that. It looks <laughs> totally crazy. Yes, unless you want that. It does look totally crazy. Um, and we're going to do a cube just so you can see that you can actually independently have two completely different static meshes when I was testing it in uh, in Seattle. I was fracturing stuff, mm -hmm. and then I turned one of the fractures into a shovel, and nice. I was like scooping the fracture pieces. <laughs> I can't actually tell you, that was actually quite a bit of fun. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really weird how, how much fun that was. So compiled it, we're going to save it, we're going to close this down. Uh, now we're going to play in VR. And if Wes puts the headset on, you can actually already see the cone right there. Um, and Yep, yep, he's got them. So I picked up the cone off the ground. Um, hold on, one of them. The battery dead on this one? Yeah, yeah, let's see, hold on. Oh. What's off? Uh, it's been losing its connection every once in a while. Um, if you guys can see on my screen here, uh, I'm going to pull this over. Ah, there we go. And. Let me click back on the window. Sorry about that, Wes. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, all of my things are green now, which means the motion controllers are working. Um, and then Wes can do, you know, pretty much anything he wants. Plays his drums. It's a juggling simulator. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you can play ball in a cup, you know. It's a classic. <laughs> um, the other thing you can do, you know, I, I twirl my, my, my pen around in my hand when I'm thinking. You can twirl these things around. Yeah, um, and it, when you put it on and you're like you're twirling it around like it's a, your real object, you quickly lose all sense of reality, and you're like, ah, oh, please put me back into the matrix. <laughs> so, and and that was it. That's I'm gonna I'm gonna kick out of here, yeah. Wes. Um, and that's it. I have motion controllers working on my VR project, and that was like, I mean, we're not even we're about 40 minutes into the stream, and yeah. most of that time was telling you like kind of the do's and don'ts about things not to do in VR. So it, it literally took prob probably about what. 10 minutes yeah. to set that up, more or less. Right. And that's it. I mean, it's, this is set up, this is, this is good to build on. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things I want to show you guys here is uh, I'm going to go ahead and I want to put in a post-process volume. And uh, this is one of the, I want to show you guys one of the things you can try if you're experiencing some, um, some performance issues, you know, right out of the box. You're not really sure what's going on. What I would highly suggest you do is come down here to your AO, your intensity, and set it to zero. Okay, and that's effectively going to turn that off. The other thing you're going to want to do uh, is come up here to the lens flare, and you're going to want to turn the lens flares off. Uh, this is not for performance reasons. It's because your eyes don't actually see lens flares. <laughs> lens flares are a direct result of light hitting, uh, hitting the camera lens and then being scattered in a mm -hmm. weird way because of some imperfection in the lens, which is something that you would totally expect in a, in a 2D game. Mm -hmm. But again, VR, we're simulating left eye, we're simulating the right eye, but not through a camera, through your actual physical eye, mm -hmm. which doesn't have these styles of, of effects. So um, if I actually, oops, not amb ambient Q map if I uh, or auto exposure I want uh, ambient occlusion there we go if I actually turn this guy back onto one oops and to one and uh, I play in VR you notice that my frame rate is actually already going down to 45 right there so um, just for now go ahead and kick this guy back over to to zero and that's gonna get you immediately back up to 90 yeah that's 90 right there and the other thing that you can do is you can come over to your world settings if you need the AO, and then you can come over to your light mass, and you can use ambient occlusion, and then you can start to mess with the direct and indirect. Uh, I'm pull these over. Uh, and the direct illumination occlusion fractur fraction. Fraction. Okay. That's, that's a mouthful. <laughs> and the indirect illumination occlusion fraction. And I almost keep saying factor for some reason. I abbreviate uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, these will, you know, they'll bake the AO that you were looking for, that you were doing in the post process, into the lighting of your level. Um, and when we, when we talk about the, the lighting and the level too, one of the other things you're going to want to do, come over here to my light source. If I clicked on my, and okay. the world settings again, we're going to click this over to static, okay? And if I put a, um, you know, I was like, you know what, I want a skylight in there. I'm going to immediately drop it down. I'm going to kick it to static. The reason I'm doing this is because at any point in the game, I want to make sure that I keep everything as cheap as possible. Mm -hmm. If I find out, you know, as I'm running the game, that, you know what, I think I could actually afford maybe some dynamic shadows just on my directional light. Right. 
we can we can turn that back on. So you know, if we were going to come over here and uh, we'll grab this guy and say, well, you know, we were going to kick him back to static. I wonder if, uh, I'm not sure if build will work, but we'll give it a shot. Um, so oh, yeah, it sweet, yeah, yeah, should be <laughs> there's nothing in there. Yeah, I, I was worried that I might not be hook, <laughs> hooked up to the farm, but there's actually nothing in this scene. Yeah. So. Um, if you know that you know you've you've got some time left, I'm going to show you right now how you can can basically figure this out. So, if I click play here, and uh, you don't have to put it on, but I'm going to mm -hmm. hit Control Shift, period, okay, and then I'm going to close this guy out, and that's going to open up my GPU analyzer, okay. And what this guy is telling me is basically whatever it is I was looking at, this is how expensive it is to render everything. So this is our base pass. Um, let me zoom in here a little bit. So we've got our base pass, which is basically like our initialization, kind of our mm -hmm. first setup. We've got our lights. We've got uh, some transforms going on there. This is our temporal mm -hmm. AA. So this is something in the post-processing. Um, mm -hmm. You might see this twice. I, I could be wrong about this, but this could be because you have to do it for the left eye mm -hmm. and for the right mm -hmm. eye. Um, then we have our fog. Then we have our post-processing, and then this right here is where it's actually going to be delivered. Um, you have your Slate UI right here, which is, you know, Slate is rendered on top of everything else, so you're always going to see Slate right here, but your scene is what you actually want to look at. And I'm going to expand this, make it a little bit bigger, and move you out of the way. Come here. And here is basically everything that's being done on the GPU. Um, for that particular view. So for example, you can see right here, I've got a view zero and a view one. So I can come down in here and I can see, you know, what's actually going on in each one of these. If I double click, it will, uh, it will go down into that event. Um, but for example, and the other thing that you want to look at is you can see that it's taking point, uh, 6.08 milliseconds over here uh, to do the entire scene. So mm -hmm. that's the, the, what you add all these numbers up to. If I come back here, and I go to my post-process volume, and I come to my ambient occlusion. Let me turn this on really quick, and I'm just going to play it again. Now I'm going to hit Control Shift uh, period to get another GPU capture of that. I'm going to turn it off. Now you can see my frame duration went to 10.32, and you're like, man, that's a lot. What's going on here? So, and this is how I found out that that the AO was giving me this issue. And I came over here, and I'm like, whoa, this is 2.64 milliseconds, 2. Point, or 2. 6.4 right. and 2.26, yeah. what is going on over here? So then I started looking down, what's going on? What? Ambient occlusion's coming in at 1.57. That's obviously too expensive for me, and it's, 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 it's halving my frame rate, so boom, it's gone. Because it's too expensive, right? And we, we have another way to make this mm -hmm. up. There's multiple ways to make up, mm -hmm. uh, because we're not doing it as a post-process. So, yeah. and this is it. This is the bread and butter of getting your VR project uh, to run at frame. And uh, we have a couple questions about uh, some of this stuff, um, and w which I'll get into in, in just a little bit. Um, but again, the uh, one other thing I want to show you guys, and we're going to come here, we're going to go to Material, and uh, we're just going to open this up. And if we come down here to mobile, you see we have these two things called fully rough and uh, this is light map, use light map directionality. Basically, this right here is gonna be, well, I could actually do it one more and come up here and we can change this to uh, unlit. This is basically going to be as cheap, cheap as, as you could <laughs> ever possibly imagine that you wanted to get with something inside of Unreal Engine 4. Okay, I'm gonna just do 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to give us kind of a grayscale. You notice I have no lighting, I have no nothing. nothing. You know, it's just basically an emissive material. Now this can be super cheap, very, very fast to render. You're not gonna have cool lighting effects or anything like that. And one of the other things you can do, you can come back here and uh, we're just gonna do this to default lit. Um, but with that, what I enabled down here in the, in the mobile, um, where'd you go? And the two things here, the fully rough, basically this is going to force the material to be completely rough, and it's going to get rid of the instructions. Basically, it's kind of saying, you know what, don't worry about this. I don't want you to, 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 you know, to worry about this roughness right here. We're gonna make this fully rough, so we're gonna get rid of some, some samplers, which is very important. We're also gonna get rid of some shader instructions as well. Um, the light mix, the light mapping, ugh, use light mapping directionality is basically a way to give you better looking light maps when it's enabled, cheaper. but 
when it's when it's enabled, the light maps are a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. And this isn't really going to matter when you have maybe, you know, just a small scene, like something like the size of the stage. But when you start to get to bigger levels, right. if you need something, you know, that's like way off in the distance or something that the player's not really going to interact with, say you have like an entire uh, facade built out, the player can see, but they can't really interact with, this is where you'd want to enable those features. And, and again, you're going to have to enable the feature, take a screenshot, re-enable it, take a screenshot, compare. Sure. Yeah. See, see if that is, is enough visual difference for you to say, you know what, let's go ahead and do mm -hmm. this on there. Um, one of the other things you can do is like you can go crazy with stuff like, uh, let's see, dot products. You could do, you know, like view. Uh, no, that's not what I want. I want the, uh, do something like a camera world position and then, I don't know, like a three vector. And you could do this. Uh, I think my math is correct on this one. Um, mm -hmm, no. Uh, might be using the wrong, uh, the wrong reflection vector here. Let's see if maybe this is the one that I want. I always forget which one it is, and then I have to end up looking it up. Yep, that's the one that I want. So basically, what I just did here is, um, so I have my reflection vector. I've my R, G, and B can be X, Y, and Z. So I basically have said I want the light more or less mm -hmm. to come from the top down. Okay, and if I turn this off, you know, I can get it to come from uh, the right side, um, or I can get it to come from, uh, it should be coming, yeah, uh, along the Y axis. Um, I would do this and then I would plug this, you know, I would multiply this by something else. Um, possibly buy like a normal map or something like that. Mm. And this is basically what I'm doing is I'm faking the yeah. lighting calculations inside of the shader so I don't actually have to put any yep. lights in my scene. So that's that's another thing that you can do. And again, this is a very simple, cost simple case. Way. But it's, yeah, super, super simple, cost-effective way that you can actually develop something that looks mm -hmm. real. Achieve the same results. Yep. Uses normal maps, stupidly cheap. Um, the other thing you're going to want to do or, or be careful of is, um, you know, uh, oh, and I hit... Alt and L, and I clicked, and that added the light uh, where my mouse was. I can do it again for you, and just a, you know, some little, little shortcuts, little shortcuts, <laughs> little inside secrets in case you didn't know about that. But you know, your lights will default to uh, stationary. Always kick them over to static unless you really need that uh, that specular highlight that it's giving you. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to be very judicious in your light usage and your light type usage when you're doing stuff for VR. So again, it's it's not going to be this like. You know, I throw this in and I throw everything at it. It's I throw something at it. I see what it does to performance. <laughs> I see what it looks like visually. If if I want it or not, okay, then it's on to the next thing. Yes, that sounds like a lot of work, and and it is. But remember, you know, this is what happens when you're on the it's bleeding edge, save right? Save time, you know, doing it the opposite way, throwing everything in and then trying to reduce. Yes, yes, exactly. Mindset to get it's, into when you're developing for VR. It's so hard to pull away from a, once everything is finished, mm -hmm. to try to find that one little thing that you can pull out, because mm -hmm. you might pull something out, it might make the entire thing collapse. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, with that stuff out of the way, the other thing I wanted to, to touch a little bit on today, and then we'll get into uh, some Q&A, is film and games. So we've got a lot of people that come mm -hmm. maybe from an architectural background or a film background where they do, you know, 24 frames for a second, each one of these frames took me an hour to render, or you know, 20 minutes or something like that. And and I just want to give you guys a little bit of um, uh, some stuff that I did a little research on. I asked one of our uh, our film guys here, kind of what his stumbling blocks were. Uh, if he would have known this stuff, like what would have made it a little easier for him to get into uh, to developing inside of Unreal? And um, I'm going to share with you some of the stuff um, that I got from him. So. See, everything you do in games, first off, is real time, right? Everything. You put down a light in the scene, like, watch this. I'll put this light down in the scene, and I'm like, you know what? I want it to be red. Mm. And uh, I'll hit OK. Yeah, you know what? That's, that's, not, that's not bright enough. OK, I want to turn its attenuation down. You know, I really want it closer to the ground like that. I actually want a couple more red lights. You know, I want, uh, I'll turn this one down, you know. I want to just do some Roy G. Biv here, so. I got a green one, ooh, it'll be a little yellow right there. And I'm gonna go ahead and go over here, I'm gonna make a blue one. And you know, so I'm doing all of this in real time. Now in 3D Max, you have the ability to kind of see mm -hmm. lights like this in real time, but the more you put in there, the more you click on, yeah. 
gonna totally degradate your scene's performance. I'm doing all this at around plus, plus or minus 90 FPS, definitely above 60, because it's, it's, it's pretty rock solid in here. But in, in games, or I should say, in film, mm. you're never gonna know what the end result looks like until yeah. you press that render mm -hmm. button. And you know, the guys who've been doing it for a really long time, they're like, yeah, these settings are gonna look like this. They click render, and a tiny little bit of post-production <laughs> color correction. They've done it a million times before. Yeah. But in video games, we don't have to do that. You see the results exactly on the screen, and that's exactly what they're gonna look like mm -hmm. when you put it on the device. Um, one of the other things, and this is something that the, uh, the film and the, uh, the architectural visualization guys probably aren't something that they're really aware of, is memory. Mm -hmm. You've got to be conservative yeah. on the memory. You might in film have two terabytes of storage space mm -hmm. to hold all of your simulation files. Well, in a game, I'm going to give you a 64 KB for that particle <laughs> effect, right? You've got to do that same particle effect with like a billionth of mm -hmm. this. I mean, that's, that's two, t two terabytes compared to 64 KB. That's... that's massive, yeah. that's a massive, massive difference that you have. And the funny thing is, is that sometimes you can get effects in games that look comparable to movies effects. Now they're not the same, right? They're definitely not the same, but they look comparable, mm -hmm. right? They, lo they, they look similar. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, again, can, I'm gonna pull up the uh, profiler again. This is gonna be your bread and butter right here. Control shift period, right? It brings up the profiler, closes my window. Again, I can come here and I can see, actually you see my scene has jumped up. It's because I added a bunch of lights in there and they're unbuilt. Mm -hmm. um, but this is where you're gonna, you're gonna wanna spend a lot of your time in here, um, especially if you come from uh, other places and you're not really sure why stuff is slowing down. Yeah. You know, in here it'll tell you, you can look over here and we can see can like. Can you sort that too, by the column? Uh, yeah, you can hit yes. it again. Yeah. Boom, yes, yeah, so we can sort. Yep. So we can see, like I said before, yeah. my most expensive thing in here is lights because I added a bunch of stationary lights which are touching each other. <laughs> and that's gonna cause, uh, cause it to be a little bit more expensive. Yeah. So, um, and I don't think I have shadowing turned off on them and things like that. So, uh, control shift period to bring up your profile. That's gonna be your bread and butter, especially for people that don't necessarily understand some of the stuff mm -hmm. that we just kinda, the optimizations that we kinda know how to do after doing this for such a long time that we don't even really think about. Yeah. Um, uh, here's another here's another interesting thing uh, for movies or for um, not so much for architectural visualization but more for movies is movies you design you around the camera mm -hmm. and in video games you don't do that everything kind of comes in a little more organically you know the the level artist he puts down some blocking volumes and then you know that goes out to the designers and they play test it and mm -hmm. they're like okay this looks good then they start adding rocks and then the art director gets called in he's like you know I don't I'm really feeling this rock over here I'd kind of like it over there and then the level designer comes back he's like dude this completely makes the, breaks the game yeah this completely breaks <laughs> the gameplay in this area so yeah. can we like push it down mm -hmm. or can we put a circle or a hole in the middle of the rock or something like that. So it's a more organic process. It's mm -hmm. a more kind of like a little bit of trial and error as where in movies, you know, like, okay, shot one has already been storyboarded out. The director already knows what's you gonna know go on. Gonna be, yeah. All the assets are, they know, I need this rock. It's gonna use this texture. It's gonna take up this amount of memory. It's gonna be in this company. And, you know, this company is mm -hmm. gonna make it. It should be coming in at this date. Um, all that stuff in movies, all that, that pre-planning that you have to do and all that setup and that very, that very tightness stuff doesn't really apply to games because it's, it's more organic. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons why it's more organic is you see everything instantly updating in the viewport and it just makes it easier for people to say, you know what, move that rock over there. Because then I don't have to say, move it over there, kick it to the render farm, let, yeah. let's look at it tomorrow in the daily, let's see what's going on. Oh, okay, yeah, it was better over there. Okay, let's move it back go through the whole pipeline again, <laughs> right? And in games, I move it wherever the heck I want to. Like, you know, I can do something like this. Um, now I made my playing floor twice the size. Boom, it's done, that's it. No extra rendering, no nothing like that. So, um, uh, kind of touching on that, building the scene uh, for the camera. The other thing, in movies, you are always, you always know exactly what the point of view is gonna mm -hmm. be. Um, so that means you always know, like you can always draw, it's easier to draw the user's yeah. eye, uh, the viewer to something because you are literally drawing them there. Yeah. Now we do this in games with light oh, a yeah. lot. We, you know, we, oh, we want the player to go to this door down there, so then we make it really bright. Or we, we lead we, them. Yeah, we mm -hmm. lead them down there and using light most of the time, you use light to lead people down uh, to wherever it is you want to go in the, pr in the particular game or particular uh, project that you're working on. 
And you do similar techniques in film, but in games you need this way more. Uh, whether that's going to be architectural visualization project that you're doing, or a walkthrough, or a movie, or something like that, you're, you're still going to use some of those principles, but a lot of stuff is going to have to mm -hmm. change. You know, um, one of the things I was watching about uh, on Pixar is they're talking about one of the. Uh, for, I do believe it was Toy Story, Rex. There was like this one scene where Rex is like 40 pixels on the screen or something tiny, like 300 pixels. And he's like a 25 gigabit object or something <laughs> like that. So it's like consuming a massive amount of memory to render an itty bitty little tiny thing on the screen. And normally, the, you know, in movies you don't have to be concerned with that. Yeah. You get a TD that will, you know, fix it or they'll do some magic in the code or something like that. And unfortunately we don't, People who are doing the magic in the code are actually making sure the game can run. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, you know, helping Wes design the gameplay or something like that. So you're going to have to be that TD uh, coming in from movies. You're going to have to be keep, a, keep a, uh, an eye on how big everything is going, how mm -hmm. much everything costs. One of the other cool features um, that Unreal has is we've just introduced this, and it's called a reference. Uh, I'm sorry, not the reference viewer. Uh, it, it's called a size map. And basically what this is going to tell you is it tells you the size of my new material. Now, if I came here to my content folder and I ran a size map on it, you could see that you know I have 33 assets totaling 17.4 megabytes because it's grabbing the engine content mm -hmm. and the C++ classes as well. So this is a good way, you know, if you're coming from film and you're making something like a character mm. and you're like, you know, you look at this and you're like, you know, I have 600 assets, <laughs> you know, totaling, you know, two terabytes of data. <laughs> Might want to cut that down a little yeah. bit. Um, but again, these are all, there's a bunch of different tools that we put in there for you to allow you uh, to kind of figure out what you have to do or where you have to, yeah, where you yeah. have to, where you have to cut down. Um, let's see, what else do we got here for you guys? Uh, when you're using the profile, and one of the other things I, I, I mentioned this before, I want to touch on again. Look for stuff that's costing more than a millisecond. You yeah. know, if you see something that's like 0.5 or 0.8. <laughs> You could spend a lot of time trying to optimize that down. Not really going to get any results from that. But if you see something that's like, you know, above, you know, one, like this is costing me six, 12, 13, mm -hmm. then you're going to want to dive down into that thing and be like, whoa, what's what's going on here? Let's check this one out uh, to make sure that you know, we're not doing something that we're not yeah, supposed to. We actually to. talked about that on the profiling uh, Twitch stream we did. Okay. And Nick came on. I think that's still out there. On, okay. On yeah, YouTube. yeah. You can find that on there for yeah, more information I think on that. We've got it on YouTube. Yeah. It's on Twitch. Um, so, yeah, if, if you're curious about the profiler, the profiler um, a whole stream, dedicated yeah, whole stream to that. on it. So, check that out. Um, everybody should be using the profiler. Yeah. It's not just for graphics programmers, everybody should be using it because you might find something that somebody else overlooked. You know, we're mm -hmm. all human. We make mistakes. That's, that's part of being human. So, the more eyes you have on it, the better it's going to be for your overall product. So that's some stuff with films and games. Um, you know, if you've got some more questions about it or maybe something you didn't, I, I explained, maybe you didn't understand, please post to the VR forums. I'm, I'm on it all the time and uh, I'll try and field some more questions on there if there's something else that you, uh, pardon me, that you wanted to know that maybe I didn't cover. So now let's go into a, to a Q&A section. So, First question I got here is says, performance is a very important topic, especially for VR. I'd love to hear some tips and tricks on how to improve performance and hit the required frame rates. Other than poly counts, what should we really pay attention to? So remember when I said earlier we were going to touch on poly mm -hmm. counts and things like that? This is the question that I was talking about. First off, poly counts, not really going to matter that much. Uh, what's really going to matter? Level of detail. And for you film guys, this is... Um, like uh, Avatar, a great example. You know, the trees that were way off in the distance, they use speed tree, it went to the last billboard. You know, so it's this, you know, 30 million poly tree when it's up and close and it's all waving and looking cool, but in the distance, it still looks the mm -hmm. same, but it's got a level of detail, which means that, you know, I have something that's maybe uh, 10,000 polygons. And then the next version, the next level of detail down is 5,000, and then it's 2,000, then it's 1,000, then it's 50. And then if you're lucky, it's only two because you have it on plane. <laughs> um, so level of details are going to work. The other thing, again, your materials are where it's going to be at. Mm -hmm. the, 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 and you can check out actually how expensive something is. If you come here to your uh, view modes and you come down to shader complexity, and shader complexity is very, very cool because it's going to turn your scene green, but what it's going to do is it's going to go from this very, very, very light green, which means it's ridiculously cheap, 
to white. And white means it's over a thousand plus instructions to render that, that particular pixel right there. Mm -hmm. um, things that really contribute to uh, giving you a super complex uh, shader complexity is going to be things like translucency overdraw. That means like I have a transparent sheet here and then I have another one under it and then I have another one here. The more and more you stack that, the more expensive it gets because it's got to go through each one of those layers to see which pixel it has to get rid of. Yeah. And it's actually not going to get rid of that pixel because it needs it there. So a lot of the optimizations, you know, when you go to fill something in, when you go to fill in a pixel, a lot of times it looks at it and says, ah, you know what? This is actually behind something. I don't need to render that. Yeah. Let's just get rid of it. Well, with translucency, you can't do that because you're literally seeing through it. So it needs to check each pixel for each layer of translucency to make sure that you can still you'll see it. Um, the other thing is with your lights, and we touched on this a little bit before, but you know, when I did the profile on this, you know, the lighting profile was ridiculous. So if I take all these guys all and I make them all static and I, oops, um, we're just going to do this actually. I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we're going to go to static here. So they're all static. And I just build this guy really quick and it should take a relatively short amount of time. I'll play it, I'll bring up my profiler, control shift period, and I will close this out, and then we come to our scene. You can see it's already Yeah, we can see it's already a seven, and we see our lights now are at 2.2, at right? And that's because we've got a directional light, which I still believe is set to stationary, and we have the um, uh, skylight in there as well. Um, and 2.2 for your light, it's not too bad. Lighting is yeah. expensive, remember that. Lighting is just an expensive thing to do. It, it's always going to be expensive to do. Um, and again, like I said, in 4.9 specifically, and uh, you're going to want to go ahead and come to your post-process volume, and you're going to want to come down here to your ambient occlusion. <sighs> ambient cube map, you are, you are killing me here. Uh, and set its intensity to zero. Okay, and that's another thing. Oh, one other thing I wanted to touch on while we're in these properties. Um, for each one of these, like uh, motion blur, for example, if you don't want any, you can just come here and set it to zero, and that effectively disables it. You can also disable the stuff going in through your I and I. Um, I like doing it this way. One of the other things I disable is I disable uh, screen space reflections. Um, they will work in VR, but they'll look really weird yeah. because you have two eyes, right? And I don't see exactly the same thing. So a better thing to use is um, these guys right here, REF. Oops, uh, is uh, reflection mm. probe actors, okay? So use these instead of the screen space reflections. It's just going to make things um, uh, a lot easier. Oh, I can't believe I forgot about this. Uh, one of the other things you want to do with your post process, if you want one like this to affect the entire world, is you're going to want to kick this unbound option right here. Oh, yeah. And uh, what that does is it basically says, override Quiet. any Everything. other post process with this one, and you can actually have something in here called the blend weight. Um, oh, I'm sorry, not the blend weight, the priority. And since this is at a priority zero, if I hit a priority one, it's gonna say, even though this other guy is unbound, mm -hmm. I want you to take this guy over because he yeah. has a larger priority. If you're inside of the post, like literally I have to be inside of it. If I didn't have this unbound checked, um, I'd have to make this as big as the world and I'd have to keep scaling it for yeah. as big as my world yeah. got, so. Yeah, this is definitely in the documentation. I remember saying this. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, def that's definitely in the docs. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I talked about today, too, uh, best practices for VR are all in the VR um, documentation for, um, I do believe it's in the Oculus section or it might just be in the straight VR section. I don't remember which one it is. I moved some things around in there to make things a little more streamlined. So, and I'm trying to move the mouse with my other mouse on this keyboard that's <laughs> not connected to. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so things you should watch out for other than poly counts is how complex your material is. And you can do that two ways. You can go in here and you can see your stats, which will tell you, you know, how many, uh, texture samplers it's using and how many instructions it's using. So instructions is, is, you know, the more instructions it is, the more expensive it is going to be rendered each pixel. The other thing you can do is you can come here to your view mode and you can check uh, shader complexity. Um, and the other thing is LODs, level of details, making it progressively less polygons as it gets further and further away mm -hmm. from the camera. And disable AO and 4.9 to get some, uh, to get some, uh, uh, totally out of brain fart. My brain just turned off for a second there to get some performance back <laughs> in your VR headset. <laughs>
So anything particular with regard to dynamic lights and shadows? All Epic VR demos seem to have mostly baked lighting and sh baked lighting with only a few moving objects. I'm having performance issues with only plus or minus 20 moving rounded cubes in my otherwise empty scene and my GPU profile tells me almost half the time the frame is spent on lighting. Well, that's, that's exactly that's, what you that's, <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, that's dynamic lighting and shadowing for you. That's if the reason we don't do it. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, Ness had, it took the words literally right out of my <laughs> mouth. Um, if we could afford to do dynamic shadowing and lighting and it was proficient and it gave you a good VR experience, we would use it in every single one of our demos. The mm -hmm. reason that we don't is because even with the, the latest and greatest tech, you know, we run these on Titans and 980s, mm -hmm. it's expensive. still too expensive. Yeah. It's still too expensive. And, you know, uh, of course, when the new GPUs come out with the dual GPUs mm -hmm. from NVIDIA and AMD that, you know, uh, are specifically for VR and things like that, then, then we'll be able to get back yeah. to this stuff. But for right now, remember, you're going to want to do stuff that's ridiculously cheap, mm -hmm. as cheap as possible. I always say, design it like it's 1999, right? <laughs> like that's 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 kind of something that you're going to yeah. have to do. You you've got to kind of put your mobile development cap yeah. on, and, and think about that. And uh, this remind me of one thing, um, and I, I should mention this more, but you need to design for your device, right? Mm. If you're doing a Gear VR project. Do not expect to be able to run stationary <laughs> lights and dynamic shadows and all this other stuff because in the end it's running on a mobile phone, right? And a yeah. mobile phone just it doesn't have that power. Um, if you're trying to run the kite demo, you're probably not going to get 8K textures to work in VR very well because you've got massive, I need this screen, I need that, that screen. That's a lot of space right there. That's taking up a lot of memory. And then I have these massive textures. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that in the next year or if you... LOD'd everything down and just ripped, pulled everything down that you possibly could, that you could you could get it to work, you probably could. Mm -hmm. But what would be better is if when you first started building it, you were like, okay, this targeted towards this type of graphics card, so let's see how far we can push it. You know, you need to do a little bit of prep work mm -hmm. before you jump into VR development to ensure that you're not pulling your hair out towards the end when you're trying to get your, pro your project out and it's just not running at frame. Um, do you know if Vive development with UE4 is supported on OS X? I do not. I've never tried. Um, it's just not something that I that I think about. We can uh, we can try it out and see. Um, I, I honestly have no idea yeah. if, it, if it works or not. Um, did you try the Aperture Science demo? Yes, I did. Um, <laughs> That's a great question. Th that, that, was a that was a pretty good one. I think I showed you that one, Wes. Yeah. My favorite one, though, is there's this one where you play an air traffic controller and you fly these planes around and then you make them land, and they've got like slow planes and fast planes. Mm -hmm. You can make them do loop-de-loops and stuff. <laughs> like, I came out on a Sunday, I played it for like two hours. <laughs> it was so <laughs> much fun. Um, let's see, what else? If I want my game to support multiple headsets, is it one base of code, one set of extra binaries for PC? Is there and on a side on on that note for mobile, is there support for any phone plus Google Cardboard solution? Okay, we don't have Google Cardboard. I've, we've said this a, a number of times. Um, I, I don't have any more information yeah. about cardboard about that. Um, but to get to the first part of this question, a headset is like a monitor. Yeah. So if your game supports Monitor, hold on. Let me make sure I'm understanding this correctly. I'll spin it around so yeah, you can so have is a is look. Is he saying like Oculus versus Vive versus something else? I'm setting up your game. Yeah, and but that will work anyway because if we come here to our plugins mm -hmm. and we come here to our uh, virtual reality, you see all these. It are, has all of that. Yeah, all these are working yeah. except for a simple HDMD. Don't turn that one on and expect the other ones to work. I ran into that problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, you've got Steam VR, you've got Oculus, you've got box. Gear right out of the box. If you're a Morpheus developer, you can have Morpheus mm -hmm. right out of the box. So I, I think Wes is right. What he what I think this person is trying to get at is, if I have somebody who wants to play, like oh, let's say Bullet Train, mm -hmm. for example, right? It was done with the uh, the Oculus, Oculus the Oculus stuff, but Steam. I want to play it on Steam VR. Um, you would have to make sure that. Steam when you kick it over to Steam VR, the controller, like the required controllers are there. Or, yeah, set up to receive. Yeah, yeah, it's set up yeah. to receive. But it would be the same as if you wanted to play a game, you built one game, but you released it on the Xbox mm -hmm. and you released it on the PS3, right? right? It, it's still going to be the same game, it's just the Xbox. The inputs might yeah, change. Yeah, the inputs might change. 
and the, the PlayStation is a little more powerful than the Xbox. But other than that, we've already been we've already been testing this yeah. internally. We did Gear yeah, VR and we Oculus. We did Gear VR and uh, I was project. yeah our we our on. Dragonfly games that we work on on Epic Friday, which is our our mobile VR game or our VR game targeted towards Gear VR and and just a lesser VR mm -hmm. say lesser VR experience a less demanding yeah. uh, computationally <laughs> VR experience is what bullet I was trying train, to say. Bullet train, yeah. it is not. Yeah, <laughs> bullet train, it is not. Um, but basically, yeah, for that one, what we're trying to do is we're taking the um, Infinity Blade assets and we're just going to show you guys how we can hack something together and just do a mashup, right? A kit mash. Mm -hmm. Take all these various parts, mash them together into uh, something mm -hmm. that's already been optimized. The only reason we, we picked gear for this is because it's already, those assets are already optimized to run on right. mobile yeah. devices. So we are going to you know, re release it, but we've tested it. Wes has tested it on the Oculus, mm -hmm. and I've used it on my Gear VR. In fact, you can see Wes and I on yeah. it in the, yeah. the, the VR videos yeah, that we we've been releasing. Yeah, 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 we both have different headsets on, but we're playing the same game. Yeah. So yes, you can totally mm -hmm. do that, but again, you gotta test, you gotta test, you gotta test. I would highly suggest you don't do this unless you have both devices available. Um, you could make an assumption that could turn out to be totally wrong, yeah. and it's it, it's it's just very hard to, to tell you like what assumption that could be. Yeah. So uh, we we'll hope you answer that for you. If that's totally <laughs> not what you were looking for. Uh, respond to us on the forums, and we'll uh, we'll try and get back to you with a more correct answer. Um, how big does the room have to be for a good VR experience? Oh, man. Uh, so one of the games that I've played is called, uh, what is it, Work Something Simulator? It basically, you're in a chef in a kitchen. Mm -hmm. And e uh, Epic Games Seattle, we had a, they had a huge VR interaction area there. And here we have a fairly large one in, yeah. our, in our room. I don't know, what would you say it was like? five foot square maybe yeah i mean it really depends on the player too like I've, I've watched some people do vr and they're all over the place like i don't know if you noticed it but when i was doing the vr for blood train i barely move i just move my arms i don't really walk around it just it depends on the space but as long as you have enough you know yeah say three to five feet and, and to walk around you should be good the most important thing too is to make sure that you don't have anything that you're going to run into that's the big thing or the one thing that i found that's that I'd like to put into to Unreal to figure out is to actually mark where there's a wall. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't keep smashing into the wall because when I was playing the plane demo, after five minutes in the headset, I forgot which direction my computer which was way in. You're facing yeah, you're I right. forgot which way I was facing. So I literally like, oh, I'm gonna get that. Oh, there's the wall right there. So I have to wait for the plane yeah. to come in a little bit. And even though I had set the the boundary up there, mm -hmm. I still forgot that you, you know over that I because mm -hmm. the other the other three boundaries I could reach over. Well, because Wes wasn't there, if I would have, I'd reach <laughs> right to his chair. Um, but I could reach over them, and you know, I, I kind of knew that I might hit an obstruction, yeah. but I wasn't. I wasn't going to hit the wall. Um, so, and, and that's in a fairly large area. I'd say that's like five by five. Mm -hmm. They say in the instructions it's 15 by 15 is the maximum. Yeah. Um, I've never been in an area to that's test out big. the maximum, yeah. and that's freaking huge. That's, that's 15 square, right? Yeah. So it's like 15 this way, 15 that way. So that's, wow. that's a very, very big interaction area. Um, the other thing, too, is if you're doing a standing game, you know, you need to make sure stuff like this is clear around me. Mm -hmm. So I could put myself in a smaller box, but I could have this stuff like this around myself to make sure, you know, I'm not, you know, I can see people doing the Wii, the Wii remote thing right into the computer every time <laughs> I every time I talk about this. But um, these do have straps, though. Yeah, so. they do. Yeah. <laughs> they have straps because it almost fell out of my hand into the computer screen one day. So they, those got put on really quickly. So it. it uh, yes, how big the room has to be, as big as you can possibly get. Yeah. Is there a, a specific size um, that I found that works? Not, not really. Yeah, it's, I've it's, seen. It's we've tested it in, in both scenarios. You know, tight and then bigger. It really, I didn't notice too much of it. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't notice. And it's, and a lot of times, like the interaction of you moving around in the world, it's not as, it's not like. Oh my God! I'm moving around in the real world. It's yeah. almost there. It's not like connect-ish. Like yeah, the connect, yeah. like you're actually walking and moving around sometimes. Like yep, yep. With this, it's more like ooh, I need to. What is that? Oops, sorry. 
sorry, my, my mic went off, but it's like, what is that right there? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, I see what they're I see what they're trying to do. That's the style of movement yeah. that you get. It's not like, oh, I'm gonna walk to Mordor, yeah. right? You know, and drop the ring in. It's like, oh, I wanna look around the side of this thing, or I might wanna like look over here, yeah. or I might wanna look over there. And that's kind of the power behind um, the Steam VR. And I'm sure as more things come mm -hmm. out and more people figure things out, you're totally gonna be able to do something like, Walk to Mordor, or whatever it is that you <laughs> want to do. Or take one of those giant eagles. Let's see. The room where I'm going to use VR is rather small and pretty encumbered. Would Vive still work, or would Rift be better in the situation? Ooh, that's a that's a tough question. It depends on how yeah. small small is and encumbered. And I do a lot of testing at my desk. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other cool things about this system is that you know the the lighthouse trackers, I mine are mounted in our room. They're mounted on the ceiling, right? So they're completely out of oh anybody's boy. way. Mm -hmm. They stay on all the time. All I have to do is just plug in my headset and turn on my motion controller. I don't have to worry about them, and that is awesome yeah. because I, they're there, they're on. Never have to worry about them or worrying about you know if with the camera you got to worry that it's at the right height. So you're probably going to have to add a tripod somewhere, mm -hmm. um, put it on the tripod. Um, make sure that it's angled correctly, so it's got a, nothing is obstructing it, you know, nothing is obstructing its field of view. With these guys, I've noticed that you can have some obstruction. Much, yeah. yeah, you pretty can much. have some obstruction. Like, if I was sitting over here, you know, with my motion controller doing this, it's gonna pick it up, even though I have a one that's directly over here and I have one that's right here. Um, it's gonna be picking up the B1 over here, and then every once in a while, it'll get the, the flash from the A. Um, now, that's not to say that you're going to be able to, you know, completely put something over here and yeah. include it, but I found that these ones work just a little, they're, the, uh, what's the word I want to use here? The, um, uh, they're a little more forgiving. That's what I was going to that's, that's, <laughs> that's what I was trying to think right there. Yeah, it's yeah. just not coming to me. They're a little more forgiving. I don't so. want to put words in your mouth. Back <laughs> <laughs> well, you can take them out of there, you know, so. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? What non-game software would be good for? good with VR. Oh man, there's so many things you could do with VR. Oh yeah. Right? Like you could do something with Rob. Our old our, <laughs> our old intern was scared of spiders. No, seriously, he, he was scared of spiders. One of the things you could do with VR is you could you could use Unreal Engine 4 to help somebody get over mm -hmm. maybe a fear of vertigo or a fear of flying or mm -hmm. a fear of spiders. Mm -hmm. Right? Because they're in an environment that's very, very easy to get yourself lost in, but mm -hmm. all they have to do to get out of that is take off the headset, yeah. and that's it. Other things you could use it for. I've seen one for public speaking, actually. That's a great one, too. Just have an audience out there. Yeah, great, great uh, to you know, help build up mm -hmm. that confidence. Um, let's see, what else could you use it for? Obviously, y movies. Yeah, <laughs> movies. Um, you could use it for like industrial design or something, like the Aperture Robot one. You know, the oh, robot yeah, yeah. parts all come apart. Well, how cool would it be to like show somebody, you know, your your new, I don't know, like you built a new washing machine or mm -hmm. something? And they're like, ooh, let me see this part, and they grab it and they pull it out like this, and you know, they see that the, and they could turn it around and look at it from different angles. I mean, literally, you could do, mm -hmm. you could do anything. Any, anything. Um, Designing your house, right? You know, uh, all those, you know, architectural digest magazines or the, the stuff like, you know, picking different paint, mm -hmm. you know, seeing what it's going to look like before it goes up on the walls and things like that. I mean, there's, I mean, the possibilities are limitless. Mm -hmm. Honestly, there's so many things that you can do with it. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Could you go over all the buttons and triggers on the Vive controller? Are there any of them reserved for the system, uh, the home button? Yes, there is one for the home button. Is that this red one? Yeah, I, th I think it's the red one. It's one of these two. <laughs> it's one of these two <laughs> buttons. I forget which one it is. I'm pretty sure it's the the red one right here. It pulls up the home menu. Um, this right here, this guy right here, he's a touchpad, kind of like a touchpad on your on your laptop or something. Mm -hmm. Then you have you can click in here, trigger. You have your two grips, and all of these are accessible by uh, by blueprints. Yep. It's literally, literally, it's as easy as accessing an Xbox 360 controller. Yeah. Wes wasn't sure, and I told him, I'm like, dude, it's pretty no, easy. Yeah. It's pretty easy. Yeah, and I'm surprised. I can't wait to start playing with it and doing some stuff through Blueprint Script for these. Yep, it's it's literally that easy it, because it is a controller. Now, where the, uh, where the interesting, more interesting stuff comes, like when I use the motion to do stuff, mm. like, you know, um, Actually, on the motion controller setup page, there is a tutorial, a little thing that shows you how to basically place an object in the world with a, a button click. Mm -hmm. And if you apply that script or that part of the tutorial 
uh, to the motion controller example, mm -hmm. you'll be able to like put Pick over up. here and right here, boom, right it's, it's mm -hmm. over there, and then you hit the other motion controller will um, destroy it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very simple, but it was mm -hmm. just to show you like what I do with one hand, I can undo with the other one. Um, and the trackpad is the only thing that I haven't currently done anything with. Um, I've been meaning to get around to it, but it's Might, just. I wonder if it functions like the touch screen, like on a I mobile device. I think it probably like, will. Yeah. I wonder if you could do taps like that. Oh, I'll have to look into yeah. it. A again, you know, this is all bleeding it's edge all stuff, new. so it's all new. So we're still learning as much as we can here internally too. So if you found out something cool that you could do with one of them, um, you know, post uh, post to the forums. You know, we'll give you an awesome shout out um, if if we can turn it into a dock or something like that. So what else have we got here? Does Parallax occlusion mapping affect shaders much or at all? Yes, parallax occlusion mapping is ridiculously expensive. Um, the reason I brought it up, though, is it's actually used in um, Showdown. When that missile hits the uh, the column right here, the the decal that it spawns to make it look like it took a big old chunk out of the, the column is actually using parallax hmm. occlusion mapping. And... Well, like I said, it is ridiculously expensive, and the reason I keep saying that is I don't want you to think, oh, this is a catch-all for everything, yeah. just go nuts with it. Well, no, like on this wall back here, you know, the, the wall that's behind me, that's not going to make a good parallax occlusion. Um, what would, though, is probably my keyboard. It's got a lot more depth cues in it than, than the wall, and it actually goes deeper down in there. Mm -hmm. Or the standard example is a brick wall, yeah. right? A brick wall would be perfect for parallax occlusion mapping, not asphalt, but a brick wall mm -hmm. because of the mortar, because of the, d the distance and the, and the bricks, um, you could have a really, really awesome looking depth on that one. But again, if you do that, you need to put it on whatever it is you're doing, come over here, check it out in shader complexity mode. You know, if you're only affecting like, you know, say these pixels that are within my post-process volume right there, that's not gonna be ridiculously expensive as if you are trying to do it to all the pixels that are covering on my screen right mm -hmm. here. So again, it's it's add it, test it, see if that is actually what uh, going to give you the results that you want at a performance cost that your project can take. Um, do VR games have depth of field effect? How is it comfortable for the eyes? I haven't mm -hmm. seen any any depth of field in any VR because your eyes automatically make mm -hmm. depth of field. Like I noticed this in Bullet Train when I went yeah. to go like aim down the gun like this. Like I could have sworn this part of the gun was getting blurry. Mm -hmm. Like uh, or I should say this part, but like this part right here, I yeah. could have felt like it was going blurry. But that was strictly because I was closing one eye, but my focal point yeah. was up here instead of down here, which is like it is in real life. So again, f depth of field was was added to games to make up for the fact that mm -hmm. you know it's it's when you go to squint like this yeah. you know it, when when you're aiming something depth of field was added to make up for that or well to just make up for different depth cues especially with cameras too mm -hmm. right and that's something that we just we don't need in VR because we already possess the ability to have depth yeah. of field um, you know it's one of those built-in human functions um, let's see, what else do we have here? So, why is there no VR camera suitable for stereoscopic screens with TV monitor? I, unfortunately, I can't answer that question. I don't know enough about stereoscopic screens. Mm -hmm. um, how do you capture a video of, VR, of a VR game without getting the VR view? Mm -hmm. I think what he's talking about is the barrel mapping. Yeah. Um, with the Vive, you get that square window that you saw. Um, you can capture from that. For Bullet Train, I do believe the very awesome Mr. Nick Whiting put in a, a reverse barrel mapping, which basically unfolds, unfolds the it. view yeah. and <laughs> then makes cool. it one view. Um, uh, but I, I don't know the, the status of that particular mm. feature. But you can do it, you know, because basically what that barrel mapping is is just a shader. There's just some shader math that's unwrapping it. Mm -hmm. So you could reverse that shader math yeah. and then run like a post process that reverses it on top so that when it gets spit back out, when you want to capture, it's 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 the correct. Um, and, and now that I'm thinking about that, I think actually the barrel mapping is done in the Oculus SDK, so you might run into some issues with mm. that. But um, if you type in reverse barrel mapping, there's a couple, I've seen a couple GitHub mm -hmm. things where people have reversed it um, to display the, the, the full images if you were seeing it yeah. on a regular 2D monitor. So it is possible to do. Um, we might have that functionality uh, available for people in a little while, but uh, if you need it like today, tomorrow, you're gonna have to implement that yourself. But again, you know, we give you the C++, yeah. right? So 
you can put that in. You could pay somebody to do it to put it in for you. So mm -hmm. I mean, and that's 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 pretty awesome. It You're could not be something that we get to down the road too. Document. Yeah, yeah, that definitely could be something we could get down the road and and look at a document for. So let's see what else. Could you guys use VR to make tutorials? How to use VR for data viz? Like the winners of the big data VR competition. Um, yeah, uh, there's there's tons of stuff that we've been talking about that we need tutorials for and things like that. And we're playing some catch up right now to make sure that you guys get uh, the, the 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 best learning resources out there for our engine. Um, but this is always something that uh, we can bring up and you know discuss at our weekly team meetings. See if that's a direction that uh, that we can go in. And, uh, more important things, we've got to have a data set that we can yeah. work with, and you start to get a little tricky with stuff like that, right? Like, mm -hmm. which data can we use? You know, what type of data is it? You know, what are the legality things behind it, and things like that. So, you know, uh, if we can do this, that does sound like something that uh, uh, would be cool, and I'll look into it and see if it's something that we can turn into a possibility. Should I target 90 FPS when I use the Vive instead of 75? Yes, um, you should target your project to whatever your device's mm -hmm. specifications are. So if you know that you're going to go out on the Vive, actually, let me take that back, you should target your specifications to whatever the highest spec you know you need. If you know you need 90 FPS, then you need to target 90 FPS. If you know you only need 65 FPS, then you target 65 FPS. If I was making a game that I wanted to go out in both, I would target 90, straight yeah. up. I would target 90. 90 would be my target, and that way I don't have to worry about you know, splitting builds mm -hmm. or starting to do crazy with the switches and my materials, yeah. and it will quickly become a data management nightmare. Um, so I would aim high and try to keep it up there as much as mm -hmm. you possibly can. And don't be afraid to cut, you know, make things smaller. Uh, any general VR rules for either camera position or player movement with regards to linear versus acceleration slash deceleration? Always give the player the ability to instantly, and when they, like, if I was to go, like, press the trigger to go forward, I should immediately start moving forward. I shouldn't accelerate up and start going forward, just boom, instantly I should go forward. When I let go, boom, I should instantly stop. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a little counterintuitive at first because a lot of games have that, you know, they kind of slow down, like GTA does this, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of go from a, a slight jaunt to a little bit more of a brisk walk to a run, yeah. and then you kind of slow down the same way. This one, no, instantly accelerated instantly decelerated. Um, are there any tutorials for sound for VR? Mm. Not at the moment. Now, uh, we've said this multiple times, our sound system is going through a giant rewrite yeah. at the time. So as that stuff comes online, we will get um, more and more tutorials about doing you know, spatialization mm -hmm. and things of that nature. But unfortunately, at this time, it, it's just not, it's not. Things uh, are being reworked. Yeah, it's not right viable now. because things are being reworked, so. And so that looks like everything that we've got um, for questions. Um, Wes, is there anything else you think we should we should touch on or, or bring back around? Uh, I think no. I think this is a good introduction. I think the next time we come on, maybe we can have something where we start to you know start to build script, out a project yeah, or something. Okay. Build something out using the controllers and stuff. Once we've had a chance to kind of digest. You know, yeah, yeah. Else. We uh, we did try to get something working, but it just ended up making <laughs> yeah, our. Yeah, I literally uh, had. Two minutes to kind of figure out what I was going to do with it. I was like, ah, it didn't work, so I gotta, I gotta so play with it myself a little bit more. And then maybe the next time we come back on, we'll have something where we're doing something with the controllers. Cool. So, well, that's it for us here today. Um, I hope you guys learned something. And uh, if there's something that you want us to maybe cover again, or something you didn't have questions on, remember post the forums. Um, I'm on there, Sam Dider. Wes is on there as Wes Bun. So um, that's it for me. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.